Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, for our next EOS talk, we have Rami Ganawar. He's the founder and director of Fight Metric, and his talk today will focus on the use of statistical analysis when analyzing mixed martial arts. So with that, please join me in welcoming Rami Ganawar. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rami Ganawar, and I'm the founder and director of Fight Metric. We are the first company to bring statistical analysis to the sport of mixed martial arts, and we're also the official statistics provider of the UFC. Now, I want to start off immediately by playing a little game called Spot the Difference. I'm going to put a couple pictures up on the screen here, and I want you to take a look and tell me what you think the most important distinction is between the two of them. Here you see two strikes being thrown by UFC middleweight champion Anderson Silva, two different kinds of strikes. Now, there's a bunch of different things you could say about them, but I just want you to focus on what you think the most important distinction is between the type of strike on the left and the type of strike on the right. Now, if you're like most people, you'd say that the strike on the left is a kick and the strike on the right is a punch. And while that is technically a correct answer, it's not the correct answer. And in fact, by answering in that way, you may have set back the cause of statistical analysis by several years. I'll explain how. What I want to talk about in this presentation is a unique opportunity that we had at Fight Metric. We had the chance to take a brand new sport, and I know this sounds crazy, but we could actually get its statistics right on the first try. That means that we didn't have to monkey about for 100 years with batting average and RBI before we figured out what the important things were. We could do this thing from the beginning. In baseball, you'd have to send Bill James back in a time machine. And while Bill James in a time machine is a wonderful name for a progressive rock band, it's not an especially practical idea in statistical analytics. But that's what we could do. Fight Metric in 2007 had this landscape in front of it. Nobody was analyzing mixed martial arts inside the fight. The data that they were collecting was restricted to the basics only. Who won, who lost, method of victory, and the duration of the fight. That is it. Nobody was looking within the fights themselves to see what the fighters were doing to earn those wins and losses. Fight metric became and remains to this day the only working data system in mixed martial arts. And I want to harp on that word data for just a moment. The temptation in this case is simply to start counting things. Watch the fights, count the number of activities the fighters perform, and then display those numbers to people for their consumption. But that's not what Fight Metric is all about. There's a huge difference between data and numbers. You see, numbers is what I'm trying to teach my daughter, but she's only one. Yes, six is a greater number than four. But that doesn't tell you anything about value, and it doesn't tell you anything about effectiveness. We have to understand more about these numbers to turn them into data, six what and four what. If we're talking about units of currency, for example, it could be six pennies and $400 bills, in which case the four is much more valuable than the six is. So merely telling me that one fighter landed six kicks and the other one landed four, four punches hasn't actually told me anything at all. We have to get deeper into the understanding of the sport before we know what these numbers represent. We need data, we need it to be hard, and we need it to be actionable. So the first thing that we had to do at Fight Metric back in 2007 is decide what it was that we were actually going to track within these fights. So we came up with a data taxonomy. That is a hierarchical ranking of the statistical categories from most important to least important. So if we come back to our two pictures again, what is the important thing about these strikes? What are we going to track about them? What is the taxonomy? Well, in 2007, the conventional wisdom looked like this. It held that the most important facet of a strike is the result, whether it landed or missed. Next comes the type of strike, whether it was a punch or a kick, like we saw in the pictures. Third was the strength of the strike, whether it was a power strike or a jab or a non-power strike. Fourth was the position of the fighters relative to each other when the strike was thrown. That would be whether it was a distance in the clinch and on the ground. And finally, the target of the strike, whether it was thrown to the head, the body, or the legs. Now, after doing a thorough root cause analysis of the sport, we came up with an alternate hypothesis. And here's what our hypothesis looked like. We kept the result at number one. We put strength at number two, figuring that power strikes would be far more effective than any other kind. We moved target up from number five to number three, figuring that strikes to the head, the body, and the legs, determining where they were, would actually be very important in terms of effectiveness. Position stays at four, and strike type moves down to number five. And without getting into the particulars of how we arrived at our hypothesis, it just takes a moment of logical reasoning to understand why we would put type at number five. To give an example, at UFC 144 this past weekend, there were five knockouts or technical knockouts during this event. One by uppercut, one by right hook, one by right cross, one by kick, and one by a barrage of punches on the ground. Now that's five different strike types, and you can categorize them any way you want. But the constant among them was that they were all to the head. That is the constant, and the variable is trivial. That's why we put type at number five. Now, you know, we did what any good data comp company would do in this situation. Uh, we established an adequate sample size. We collected our data using our proprietary scientific methodology. And then we ran the numbers through a binary log logistic regression model to see what correlated most strongly with victory. 
and here are the results. Not surprisingly, strike result comes in at number one. If you're talking about effectiveness, landing your strikes is far more effective than not landing them. Uh, target comes in surprisingly at number two. Where you land your strike two, specifically to the head, turns out to be the most important facet after having landed it. Strength comes in at number three, position at number four, and type is grayed out. It's because it didn't meet the threshold for statistical significance at all. We were this close, we were this close to having a trivial thing be the second most important thing in our taxonomy. And there's an irony to all of this, because it's likely because of images like Bruce Lee in kung fu movies kicking 100 henchmen unconscious that we place so much inherent and intrinsic value on kicks. We think of them as much more effective than punches are. But it was Bruce Lee himself who says in the Tao of Jeet Kune Do that we need to absorb that which is useful and discard that which is useless. And we were this close to absorbing that which is useless and discarding that which was truly useful. So with our first attempt at analyzing the sport of mixed martial arts, we hit upon a massive shift in the way that fights need to be analyzed. And we came up with a maxim that remains true to this very day. It does not matter what you strike with. It only matters where you strike to. And this was an important first step for us. We continued collecting our data. We ended up collecting the complete histories of organizations like the UFC, Strike Force, Pride, Dream, WEC, and others. We ended up with a huge data sample that we would then be able to run our analysis against. But we started to see some irregularities in our data. And it came to the fore most prominently in 2009 when we were doing a custom research project on behalf of the UFC about a fighter named Lyoto Machida. Machida had recently won the UFC's light heavyweight title. Uh, he had stormed through his first seven opponents in extremely dominant fashion, so much so that when he won the title, UFC announcer Joe Rogan proclaimed at the beginning of the Machida era. And what was interesting about Machida was that he defeated his opponents in a way that no one else had. He was using a karate style, which was unusual. Uh, his style was based on speed of movement, accuracy of strikes. He would dart in, land his strikes with extreme precision, and then get out of the way before his opponent could land a counterattack. Before our very eyes, we were watching something happen that had never happened before, or so it seemed. We were seeing a fighter who was far more accurate with his strikes than anybody who we could think of other than maybe Anderson Silva. But when we ran the analysis and the query to see where Machida stood among the UFC's top strikers in terms of accuracy, we were shocked to find him at 15th place. And even more surprising was the fighter who came in at number one, Matthew Riddle. Who's Matthew Riddle? Well, if you're not a hardcore fan of the sport, you probably have never heard of him. And that was a big problem, because the question was, how could Matthew Riddle be the most accurate striker in UFC history? And nobody had any idea that that was true. Well, we started to look at Matthew Riddle and a lot of the other 14 names that were ahead of Machida's on this list of total striking accuracy, and we started to see a pattern. We saw other names like John Fitch, Matt Linlin, Vladimir Matyushenko. These are all players who have the same style. They're called top position wrestlers. Their modus operandi in a fight is to take the other fighter down, stay on top of him and land dozens and dozens of short strikes. Not terribly damaging or, or effective ones, but enough to keep busy so that the referee will avoid standing them up so that they have to do something they're bad at, which is fight at distance. The problem was that total striking accuracy became a proxy for the style of fight. If you were a guy who spent most of your time at close range, your accuracy would be high, and if you were a person who spent his time at distance, your accuracy would be low. To give an analogy in football, imagine if a, a, a quarterback's accuracy was measured as every time they let go of the ball, did it land safely in the hands of a teammate. Now that could be a 40 yard pass downfield or that could be a handoff to the running back. The problem here is that even a guy like Drew Brees, his accuracy would pale in comparison to a caretaker quarterback who does nothing more than take the snap, hand it off to the running back and get out of the way. That's true, yes, he did put the ball accurately in the hands of another player on his team, but that hasn't told you anything about how good a quarterback he is. So we took a look maybe at just looking at power strikes. Instead of looking at all strikes combined, let's look at power strikes, and that way we'll get rid of a lot of these little tiny strikes. That's what these guys were landing. And these short strikes in the clinch and on the ground land with about 90% accuracy. So let's remove those from the equation. We'll just take a look at power strikes. And we saw Machida move up to 10th place, which was a little better. But wrestlers still dominated the category because even at close range with power strikes, your accuracy is likely to be far higher. But more important than that, what happened was we were ignoring one of the most important facets of mixed martial arts, one of the most important weapons in a fighter's arsenal is the jab at distance. It's the first punch they'll ever teach you in any boxing class, and we were removing it from the equation because we were only focused on something that we had called power strikes. Now we're gonna do spot the difference again. In looking at these two, th these two pictures, which of these strikes would you call the power strike among them? There's only one of them. Well, it's tough to tell. We would have to call the strike on the left by George St. Pierre a jab. Why? Because it's a straight punch thrown with his lead hand. That's the definition of a jab. 
The strike on the right by John Jones is a kick that he threw with his rear leg up top. You have to throw that with a good, a good deal of velocity. So we call that a power strike, but you can see that the distinction between this is subtle. What happens when we get to close range? Here you see two strikes being thrown by Kurt Pellegrino. On the left, we'd have the non-power strike, and I think this one makes a pretty clear distinction between them. There's no windup. There's very little distance between the two fighters. There's no freedom of movement in either the torso or the hips. There's likely to be very little power generated by this strike. Strike on the right, you can see there's a lot of distance, big windup, freedom of movement of the torso. This one is clearly a power strike. No problems here. But what about this? Neither of these is a power strike. And that was the problem. We were lumping together unlike things. We were so worried about grouping together apples and oranges that we basically said that apples and pineapples were the same thing. And they're not. These two strikes are very, very different. One on the left is an extremely effective strike thrown with a lot of power. The one on the right, not so much. It's really there just to keep busy. But we were lumping together these things in terms of effectiveness because we were saying there was one monolithic category called power strikes and one called non-power strikes. And they suffered from comparison. That's it. So what we needed to do was change nothing about our data collection methodology, nothing about the way that our data comes into the system. The only thing we needed to change was the grouping of our data. In baseball terms, we needed to create a new split. And we created a category not surprisingly called significant strikes. And significant strikes includes every strike at distance, figuring that there needs to be a requisite amount of velocity to get you from your hand or your foot to the opponent at distance, and all the power strikes in the clinch on the ground, meaning at short range. Or put another way, it includes every strike other than the little tiny ones that happen at short distance, such as the one you see on the right. And this solved two problems for us. If you remember before, our hypothesis stated that strike strength would be the second most important variable in our taxonomy. And surprisingly, it came in at number three. But that's because we were asking the wrong question. By looking at strike strength, we were losing out on a very important facet of mixed martial arts. If instead, we focus on strike significance, you see the results second on the right, all of a sudden it comes in back at second place where it belongs. More importantly for us in 2009, when we ran the query of significant strike accuracy to see where Lyoto Machida fell, he was second all time, right behind Anderson Silva, the man that the conventional wisdom had accurately described as the most accurate striker in UFC history. And he always was. The Matthew Riddle thing was a piece of trivia. It was a mistake that was based on a bad data grouping that we were able to correct, and we're happy that we were able to correct it early on, because significant strikes has become the benchmark by which fighters are measured between each other in their fights. Now, I would love to talk about mixed martial arts all day. Unfortunately, I think I'm running a little short of time. I would love to go through all the things that we learned in the early days, uh, and I'd love to even show you some of the incredible things that we can do with the data once we've collected it. We've come a really, really long way uh, from the very early days of, mix of uh, fight metrics. But in conclusion, I want to talk to you just about a wonderful phrase, a saying, a motto, the Freemason tab that I think describes what we do to a T. Ordo ab chao means order out of chaos. We all look at our data sets. We see a lot of numbers. When we look at a mixed martial arts fight, when we look at a NASCAR race, when you look at a busted football play, what you see looks like chaos. It looks like there's no order in here. But if you look at the data correctly, if you do your data groupings correctly, if you look hard enough and your analysis is intelligent, you're able to find incredible observations and analyses here. All we have to do is ask the right questions. We've been at it for about five years, and we can't wait to see more of it. We're happy that you guys are along for the ride. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions that you guys have in the meantime. My, my question regards uh, body blows. Basically, what is the, the corollaries you guys saw between blows to the head and blows to the body, if there is anything that led to a uh, certain amount of body blows that would create a similar thing to the head blows that lead to most knockouts. It's a really interesting thing when you talk about guys who mix strikes, that is they mix up their targets. What we found is that at an individual fight level, there's not a lot of correlation between strikes that are not to the head and effectiveness. But what we also found is that fighters who mix up their targets, as in they're not strictly focused on the head, are far better than fighters who just concentrate on that one at location. And what it means is you have to lower your predictability. If everybody knows coming into the fight that you have one task, and that is to just hit the other guy in the head, it's a lot easier to defend. So even though those body and leg strikes uh, are not terribly effective when it comes to ending fights, and they don't end very many of them, the fact that the opponent has to worry about you hitting them there turns out to be extremely important when it comes to an effect the effectiveness of a fighter. Uh, very interesting outline of the history. What was the biggest debate you had in terms of coming to the significant strike metric? What was the biggest argument your group had about what constitutes significance and distance, power, and how you assess that from the data? The biggest uh, debate we've had is what to call it. 
honestly. I know that didn't answer your question. Uh, the problem with calling it a significant strike is that uh, no one really understands what that means. If anyone has a better idea for what we should call this category, please tell me afterward. Uh, even at this late date, I'd be very happy to change the name of it. Um, but you know, the question comes down to our methodology. When we say that it includes all strikes at distance, well, that's easy because distance is something that you can measure. And then it comes down to power strikes in the clinch and on the ground, the ones that are at short range. That's difficult to measure, but we try to distill it as best we can, and the only way that we, s we score our fights um, for official record keeping purposes is through the use of slow motion replay. You cannot do this in real time. I really, really wish that we could. If we could score it in real time, it would solve so many problems for us. I would love to score in real time. I'd also love lower cholesterol, cholesterol on a pony, but I'm not gonna get any of these three things. So that means that we're stuck using slow motion until somebody comes up with a way for us to do this another way. Once we're using slow motion technology, we look at a bunch of different visual cues and we can figure out what constitutes a power strike uh, with consistency. Hi, um, I'm wondering if you can comment on judging. And there's a lot of things I could ask, but maybe just generally, you know, there's bias and a lot of people think that judges aren't always right. And how do you calibrate your system? How do you think about you know, what truly is an effective strike or not when you your result that you're measuring, a win or loss, or a round, you know, who won a round or a match, may be biased or flat out wrong? Yeah, we ignore it. That's the answer. When we did our analysis, when we looked at correlation with victory, we took decisions out of this entirely. We said we can't trust a single judge. We don't know any of them. We don't know if they're right. We don't know if they're wrong. So let's just remove this out of our, uh, our data set, and we'll take a look at what happens when fighters actually finish their fights. Because at that point, we know who won and who lost, and it was definitive. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions in there where it may have been an early stoppage and so forth, but by and large, we can trust the data because we know that the fight ended. When the fight goes to a decision, we have no way of knowing you know, a priori whether the decision was a good one or a bad one. So uh, we removed it from our data set. So what you see here, the reason why we call this effectiveness is because the only way we know that a fighter wins this fight is if he actually takes it into his own hands and finishes it. One other question uh, regarding submissions. What are you guys doing as far as the research into like body positioning for certain fighters that can get down on the ground or get in the clinch and get into a position to submit another fighter? What's your research been uh, telling you there? Well, we take a look at the value of the positions themselves, and we don't look at it from a submission versus non-submission perspective. What we want to know is, what is the value of, let's say, mount or half guard? Uh, you can do a lot of things from those positions. Uh, from half guard, you can do some submissions. You can also land some strikes, but more importantly, you can get to a better position. So the value of something like a half guard, which is not especially dominant, may be that it is a way station to a better position. So our research would show us that there is a continuum of positions that goes full guard, half guard, side control, mount, and back. That's it. If you want to go from left to right, that is getting from worse position to better position. Um, what you do with that position, that's what defines effectiveness. We do give you, we have a, something which we call our total effectiveness score. It's something which stands in as a proxy for judging, uh, even though it's not based on the same criteria as the unified rules are. Um, but in doing so, we also give credit to people for achieving these positions because they are able to do effectiveness with them. Okay, thank you so much.